So if you brought a Bible, go to the last part of chapter 1, the first part of chapter 2, or take a Bible app, however you can access uh, God's Word. Let me kind of set up where we're going. In the first century in the Mediterranean world, an unexpected movement started that went viral, and they couldn't stop it. Um, It went viral because something was happening in this movement that was happening nowhere else in in the world at that time. It was the Roman world. The Romans had plenty of gods. They had gods running out of their ears. They had temples on every street corner almost. Religion was everywhere in the Roman Empire. But this movement had the one thing the Romans could not find anywhere else. It had community. It had love. You see, the women in this movement would go out by the rivers And they would look for babies that people had just uh, thrown away, uh, tossed into the river. And they would rescue these babies and bring them up in their own homes or find them homes. Uh, Widows whose sons had left them and widows had no other resource at all. Widows were taken in by the movement and cared for and nurtured and loved. And men, strong, godly men's men, were gentle with children, and they were honoring to women. And it was unlike anything the world had ever seen at that time. In fact, a Roman emperor named Hadrian commissioned a a, a man named Aristides to investigate the movement and bring him back a report. So this man did. He saw the movement in action. We're talking about the Christian movement, the church. He saw them in action, and he brought a report back to the emperor. It was a mixed report, but he said something that has come down through the ages. Um, He said this, Look how they love one another. Our people don't love each other. They hate each other. They're trying to kill each other. Look how these people love each other. How often do you hear those words said about people in churches today? They've watched people in churches. People who are not in church watched us in church. And more often than not, perhaps, they're inclined to say, behold, how they fight with each other. How they hate each other. How they judge one another. And you would think we were more enemies than members of the same family. We, the, we, we celebrate communion, Lord's Supper, because the night before Jesus died, he met with his disciples on the second floor in the city of Jerusalem in this little place and had with, what we call, had with them what we call the Last Supper. The custom was there was a boy at the door, a slave boy, a servant boy, some low... low uh, intelligence person, perhaps, whose job was to wash their feet. They would come in from the dirty streets, all kinds of filth in the street, and, and to make themselves presentable, his job was to wash their feet. But there was no boy there. There was no towel boy. And so the disciples all came in. They didn't wash each other's feet because either they thought that was beneath them or they assumed someone else would do it. And Jesus came in, reclined at the table, sat at the table, looked around, and got up and did what no one was expecting He went, took a basin, he poured water into a basin, took a towel, and he went person by person, disciple by disciple, washing their feet. And then when he finished, he sat down and he said, do you know what I've done to you? Well, yeah, you've washed our feet. And he said this, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And I think most of the disciples in a heartbeat would have washed Jesus' feet. I mean, how could you not wash Jesus' feet after who he is and what he's done? But that's not what Jesus said to do. He said, wash one another's feet. And then he said this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know if you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It's easy to love Jesus. How could you not love Jesus after all that he has done for us? It's not so easy to love other Christians. In fact, maybe you've heard, to dwell above with those we love, all that will be glory. To live below with those we know, well, that's a different story. And that's often the case. But the mark of a Christian, according to the Bible, is that we love. The most powerful witness that we have, the most impactful witness is not going and telling people, 
What's so bad about them? It is the fact that we literally treat one another with love. We love one another because you can't find that so easily in the world. Some of you come in and you're tired and you've been beat up all week long. There ought to be one place where you could come in, be yourself, be accepted, be forgiven, be loved, be cherished, be, because you matter. It's the most powerful witness we have, says Jesus. You want to make an impact on people around you? Love one another because it's so different. I was thinking last night, you may be here and you're kind of skeptical about the Christian faith. You've got questions or you're trying to get some, some clarity. I know if I were not a Christian and I look at the way some people treat one another in the church, I would not become a Christian. I mean, that would do it for me. And Peter's going to help us. He's writing to people who are away from home, uh, and it's not because of an extended vacation. They are, some of them are running for their lives. It was a dangerous time to be a Christian, the people he's writing to. It was hard. It was hard to be a Christian. And when life is hard, and all of us know about that, all of us go through times, life is really, really hard. Our love gets thin we kind of turn inward on ourselves. And we stop thinking about loving other people. Um, when we would go through a tough spot, uh, spot in, in our family, Ruthie will tell you, I would sometimes call all four of our kids in and sit down and say, we're going to have a family council right here. We're going to have a little family meeting. Look, we know things are not real easy. You guys are all different. But we're a family. And we're going to love each other, and we're going to pull for each other, and we're going to help each other because we're a family. And I think that's what Peter is doing in this section we're going to look at, First Peter, the last part of chapter 1, chapter 2. He's calling this little family meeting uh, to encourage the people he's writing to. So I'm going to read this. I want to ask you to stand in honor of God and his word. Let me read this for us. 1 Peter 1, through chapter 2, verse 3. And by the way, when, he, when this was written, they didn't have chapter divisions or even verses. So we can just blow right through from one chapter to another. Verse 22. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. You may have a different version. Just track along with me. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God for all flesh is like grass all its glory like the flower of grass the grass withers the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever and this word is the good news that was preached to you you know what the good news is the good news is God is good to really bad people now that's good news to some of us so verse 1 chapter 2 so Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up to salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This is God's word and you can be seated. Now there's a lot of material here about the dynamics of how to grow as a Christian. Um, how God has shapes us and, and, he, and he hones us. How God moved. There's a lot of material here on how to move from where you are to where you're more like Jesus. What I want to do is I want to, I want to focus in on one truth. There's a lot of other material here, but I want to talk about one thing that Peter says, or actually two things about love and how to love, and then I want to give you, if I have time, I'll give you two practical suggestions or uh, principles on how to love. Here's the first thing Peter says. Loving other Christians, members of the same family, with brotherly love, sincerely, earnestly, from a pure heart, is really hard. In fact, it is so hard, it's impossible. He doesn't just say love each other. What it, this is, he, he uses this sandwich. He starts out by saying, you've purified your soul by being obedient. And then he talks about your very insides are being are being cleaned because you're connecting to the truth of God. You're bringing it into your heart. You've been born again by imperishable seed. You've got supernatural power running in you right now. Then he says, love one another. And then after he says, love one another, he says, now rid yourself of all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. And then he starts talking again about spiritual growth. What's going on here? Why doesn't he just say what he wants to say? Love each other. It's because he knows that we can't do that. It's just too hard. 
unless you've been born again, and even then, if you've been born again, unless you are growing spiritually, you don't have the capacity to, to do this. It's just too hard. Sometimes I hear people say the message of the church just needs to be love people everywhere as if that's going to change the world. I'm watching this Netflix movie, and this pastor's in the movie, and they're always weird, and it's probably accurate, but... Um, the pastor, and the pastor says, it's not my job to convert you. Uh, it's my job just to tell you to love your fellow man, to follow the model and the example of Jesus. And, we, and that's right. We ought to follow the, the love and, and the model and the example of Jesus. But it's crazy to think you can just tell people, love one another, and it's going to happen. It's just too hard. We tell people, Follow the golden rule. Follow the Sermon on the Mount. We think the world's going to be a better place. But the kind of love he is talking about here, we are incapable of doing that unless we have been born again and unless we are growing spiritually. There's no other way you can do it. Now let me put it like this. Loving other people, loving other Christians is so difficult and it is so life-altering that unless we're born again by the Spirit and we're growing we're not capable of doing it. We're just absolutely incapable of loving people the way Jesus loved us. Not only people who have been born again, people who are not growing, we just don't have that capacity. I saw a bumper sticker that, says, that said, uh, do random acts of kindness. That's not what he's saying. He is saying intentionally love people from a pure heart, from all of your heart, sincerely, earnestly. I mean, how hard is that? And if that's not hard enough, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I want you to put away, the, literally it means strip off dirty clothing. Um, so he says, I want you to get rid of some things in your life that are keeping you from loving people. That are th the bad stuff in your life, and he mentions five toxins, five poisonous uh, attitudes. Number one, all malice, he says. And malice is the idea of just being hostile towards someone. Maybe they've hurt you. Maybe they're just mean. And, and, and you, you feel hostility toward them. It's the same word we get our word malignant from. So here's what Peter is saying. You need to do an MRI on your soul. And you need to find if there's any toxin of hostility in you. And you need to dump it. Strip it off. Toxin number two, he says, all deceit. Which is misleading people for a selfish purpose. It's being afraid of showing your real self. It's thinking, if you knew me like I really am, you would not love me. So we, we pretend. Uh, this is a student who plagiarizes another student's paper so he gets a good grade. It's deceitful. This is the job applicant who exaggerates their skills and their responsibilities in the last company so they can land another job. This is misrepresenting myself as better than I actually am. This is tricking someone into doing something because I want them to do it. Husbands and wives, Peter says. Husbands and wives, no deceit in your relationship. No secrets. You know, sometimes husbands and wives kind of give themselves a pass, give each other a pass to just withhold some information. Peter says, no deceit at all in your marriage. Toxin number three, all hypocrisy, he says. And that word hypocrisy means being a play actor, putting on a mask, pretending to be something we're not. It's the idea that at, when I'm with Christians or I'm at church, I act one way, and when I'm at work, I act a different way altogether. He says all envy, that's the fourth toxin, and we all know the strength of envy. It means I'm happy when bad things happen to you, and I'm sad when good things happen to you. It means I feel sad when you succeed, when you have lots of friends. I feel great when you're fired or you're sick or you get caught or you fail. So a young couple says, why are we still renting when they have a house? How come she got the promotion? There they go again, another new car. I bet they're in debt. That's what we do, isn't it? It's the opposite of all. Love celebrates when another person succeeds. And toxin number five, he says, is slander of every kind, and that's the feel-good sin. Because it feels good to have information about someone else and, and share it. You know, we kind of lift ourselves up a notch by putting other people down a notch. It makes me feel important. And we often rationalize by saying, well, it's the truth. The problem is not the, the, the issue is not the truth. The issue is you're putting someone down rather than lifting them up. So how you doing with these? <laughs> how you doing with stripping off all of that? 
Just hard. Just hard. Or look at it this way. When people hurt you, persecute you, they, they mistreat you, what do you do? you got three options. I think you've only got three options. Number one, you come after them and hate them. You seek justice. You get those wrongs uh, uh, redressed. But you do it with vengeance in your heart. You see them get what's coming to them. That's one option. You go after them and you hate them. Here's the second option. You don't go after them. You just clam up. You just stew on it. You hate them, but you don't go after them. Those are the two options. Go after them and hate them, or don't go after them and hate them. Here's the third option. You go after them and love them. You make sure justice is done. You redress the wrong, but you do it without a single ounce of vengeance in your heart. You want nothing but to see this person come to repentance, come to a place of of truth, and you've got nothing in your heart at all. Which of those three is the easiest? Which is the most counterintuitive? It's always number one or number two with us. You conflict lovers, you go after them and hate them. You conflict avoiders, you clam up, but you hate them. The Christian way is number three. You say, how in the world can you do that? That's the point Peter is making. You can't. It's just too hard. You've got to be born again from above, and then you've got to have the supernatural power of God working in you because you're growing spiritually. Let me say it a different way. Someone comes up to you and says, what does the Bible say and teach that we should do when someone hurts us? Because we know what we want to do. We want to go after them and hate them, or we want to not go after them, but in our minds stick little pins in them and, and hate them. And the Bible just reverses that. You have to go after them and love them. And someone says, that's ridiculous. That's, that's just impossible. Well, of course it is. It's what the Bible says we're supposed to do, and we can't do it. Turn the other cheek. That's what this means. Turn the other cheek doesn't mean you let people walk all over you. No, when Peter, when, when Paul was arrested, he appealed to Rome, to, to Caesar. When Jesus was slapped in the face, he said, you can't do that. That's illegal. It doesn't mean you're a, a, a doormat. The Bible says you can un- uphold justice, but you can let God be the ultimate judge. You can give a person over to the ultimate judgment of God and let him deal with them. You go after justice, but without any vengeance at all in your heart, only love. This is a call to love brothers and sisters in Christ like God loved us in Christ. And it is so opposite of what everybody else does. It is so hard. It's only possible if you've been born again and you're growing spiritually, which is why Peter says, you've been born again. You've been purified. It means that Now you can actually love like this. That's why it says keep growing unless you are craving the pure, sincere milk of the word. You can't do it. So, number one, love is so hard, it's impossible without spiritual growth. And then he says, it's almost the opposite, it is inevitable if you are born again. So he says, it is absolutely necessary to prove that you are a Christian. In fact, the acid test of how you can know you are a Christian is love. How do you know you're a Christian? How do you know that? You pray to prayer, but other people say pray to prayer. How do you know you're a Christian? Did you know there's a book in the Bible written to help us to know if we're Christians or not? It's the book of 1 John. And 1 John says there are three tests that you can put yourself through to know if you're a Christian. There's the doctrinal test. That's believing Jesus is who he claimed to be, the God-man. There's the moral test, which means you live a godly life, and that demonstrates that you are a Christian. And then there is the social test, which is loving people. In fact, 1 John 2, 9 says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Look at verse 22 here, what he says in 1 Peter 1. He says, look at the sequence. You have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. You've obeyed the truth. You've let the truth come into you. You've taken the gospel in. It has purified your soul for what purpose? And he uses the little Greek word E-I-S, ice, which means unto, for a purpose, with this result. And he says this, you've obeyed the truth, you've appeared by your soul for the purpose of being able to love. You can love other Christians without malice, without deceit, without hypocrisy, without envy, without slander, because you've done that. You know the reason why love is the acid test of whether you're a Christian or not? 
It's because you can fake the other two, the other two tests. The doctrinal test. You can say, oh, I believe Jesus really is who he claimed to be. And you can live in a scrupulous life because you were raised that way or you have to do it to keep your job or it's expected of you. But you can't fake the love test. You can look at a person who's very moral and say, he is, he is a Christian, a real Christian. And Peter says, maybe, maybe not. The real evidence is a loving spirit. It's a far better acid test than whether you understand the gospel. It's a test whether you understand the gospel much better than just living a moral life. Or let me put it a different way. He says, in, take the opposite of, of chapter 2, verse 1. Take the opposite of all those things, deceit, malice, etc. If you're a cold person, if you're a distant person, if you're a judgmental person, if you're a critical, demanding person, if you're not a very approachable person, you better look hard to see if you've really purified your soul by obedience to the truth. Because it doesn't look good. It's possible to, to be in deep denial about the gospel. How do you know? You can say, Sam, I've been coming to the orchard. I understand justification by faith. I understand that I'm not saved because of my works. I'm, I'm saved because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. I, I, I got all that, but deep in your heart, you really believe God accepts you and God likes you and God loves you and God blesses you because you're a good moral person, because you do good things. How do you know if that's you? You, really, you say, I believe all of the, 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 the doctrine, but you really deep in your heart believe God likes you because you're a good person, a moral person. How do you know if that's you or not? Well, one of two things is going to be true about you. Either you will be a smug, demanding, self-assured, cold, critical person, wondering why other people can't be as faithful as you are. When you see your brothers and sisters doing something stupid, doing, doing something wrong, hurting themselves, hurting other people, you just leave them alone. You just write them off. You just dismiss them. You reject them because you're cold to them. Or instead of being cold and smug and demanding, you're sensitive, you're nervous, you're defensive, you're insecure, you're easily slighted, you're touchy. In either case, you're not warm, you're not forgiving, you're not open, you're not approachable, you're not gracious. And the Bible says this is the way you know you really are a Christian. You genuinely love people. So are you? Do you find yourself forgiving people who hurt you? Do you find yourself um, affirming people even as they mistreat you? Do you find yourself being able to pull for people when they succeed and they're more successful than you? Do you find yourself being open and, and vulnerable and, and gracious in your dealings with people and in your face, your smile, your eyes, the, the manner that you speak so people know and they can come and talk to you about your problems? Or are you peevish and touchy and sensitive to criticism and cold and demanding and always feeling like people are sliding you? This is the way you know you believe the gospel. You purify your soul by, by taking the gospel in, connecting with it, letting it go deep inside it. It's purifying you so that you can love other Christians as brothers and sisters, sincerely, earnestly, without hypocrisy or deceit or slander or any, any of that. It's a really searching test. I'm not saying doctrine is not important. You can't be a Christian if you don't believe the, the truth of the gospel. I'm not saying morality is not important. You, you can't be a Christian if, if you're just going on living a, an ungodly life. But doctrinal purity and morality, clean life, those can have non-gospel roots. So it's acid test. So do you love one another? Think of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He blew all, he blew all, believed all the right things. He comes to the right person, calls him good. Only God is good. I've done all these things. I've kept all the, the Ten Commandments. But he walks away. He's not a Christian because he doesn't love. He loves his money more than he loves the poor and other people. So here's what Peter's saying. This kind of love is impossible without God's help. Lots of God's help. You've got to be in a growth pattern. And he says, this kind of love is absolutely necessary. It's the outgrowth of believing the gospel. So you say, how do you do this? How do you do this? And I want to give you two suggestions if I have time. Here's the first suggestion. You preach the gospel to yourself. 
You preach the, I love what Tim Keller, how, how he puts it. He says, the gospel is you're a lot worse than you think you are. And you're a lot more loved and accepted than you ever dreamed. You're a lot worse than you ever thought. And you're more loved, welcomed than you ever dared hope. Do you believe you're a sinner? Then no matter how mad you get at people, you realize you may be seeing things in a self-centered way with limited perspective. You, you might be wrong. Do any of you remember what a fool you were five years ago? You look back and say, I, I was an absolute idiot. Well, if that was the case, that was, that's from this perspective today. In five more years, you may be looking back to today and saying, what an idiot I was today. We have such limited, limited perspective. And a person who believes I'm really, I'm really worse than I think I am, they accept that. They, they understand that. Do you believe you're a sinner? If so, you're very careful not to write people off, to hold grudges, not, not to, believe, to believe you're the only one who is right and the other person is always wrong. Do you realize the difference between a respectable person and a drug dealer in the streets of Memphis is a very small difference? We both sinned. We all both fall short of the glory of God. If you believe that, it just changes your attitude toward other people. It's why you can forgive and be open and, open and, and you put away malice and deceit and all those things. And here's the other part of the gospel. I preach to myself... I'm really more sinful than I thought, and I am more deeply accepted and loved than I ever dared hope for. I want you to think about a person who has been obnoxious, who is really annoying to you. Don't look at them. Just <laughs> put, put, just put them in your mind for a moment. You got that person in mind? You've got a picture of that person in your mind. They're hard to love. They don't deserve your love. They wouldn't return your love if you gave it to them. They wouldn't receive it. How are you expected to love those people? Well, you can because you've seen it done. Because when Christ died on the cross as a sacrifice for sinners, he did it when you were annoying and you were hard to love. And without his help, you never would have returned his love to him. And you never would have received it without his love. You have seen it, which is why verse 23 says, you've got to have the new birth. We've experienced sincere, earnest, uh, pure of heart love. And you can't love unless you've experienced love. And we've experienced that. And when I preach the gospel to myself, I remind myself of how he has loved me. What happened on, you know what happened on the cross? Jesus blew the roof off of our sins that separate us from God. And he knocked the walls down of those things that separate us from other people. That's why the cross is like this. We have access to God now, and now we can love other people. The ground's level at the foot of the cross. And I remind myself of that, which means it's not your color of skin. It's not your social status. It's, it's not. Just like me, you're a sinner, saved by grace, and you are more deeply loved than you ever thought you would be. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a successful uh, doctor in England in the 1930s. In fact, he was in line to become the physician to the queen. He had attended Hoarders uh, Medical Institute there in London, and he'd become a Christian. So you've got this wealthy, influential doctor who's become a Christian. And one Christmas Eve, he is walking to a Christmas dinner, Christmas Eve dinner, and he passes the Salvation Army Band. And they've got these big signs that say, Jesus saves. And they're, they're playing all these instruments out of tune. And, and people are laughing at them. And he's embarrassed. He's embarrassed at them. So he goes to the Christmas dinner, Christmas Eve dinner, sits down. And after a moment, he turns to his wife. And he says to her, those are my people. I'll never be separated from them again. They love Jesus. And I love Jesus. We're one, same family, same blood was shed for us, same word was given to us, same Holy Spirit given to us as them. So that's one. Let me give you one more. I got a little bit of time, maybe. He says we're to love each other earnestly, earnestly. And that's an interesting word in Greek because it means to be stretched to the limit. It's the word of Je that's used of Jesus when he's at, in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's sweating blood and he is stretched to the limit. It's a word that was used in ancient Greek of running in the Olympics where you are 
running all out everything you've got. You're pouring it on in the Olympics. And he says, that's the way, that's the way we're to love each other, to the very limit. Um, I started running eight years ago. Um, watched my daughter and son-in-law run Zoom through the zoo, and I thought, that looks like, I think I could do that. And, and I began running. And I learned something, that the more you exercise, the more you run, the stronger you get. Now, the first mile is horrible. You hate it. it, it just, it's just awful. But the more you exercise, the, and you, you begin to exercise, and it, the stronger you get. Now, it drains you, but the fact that it drains you, you get stronger. Any of you ever been sick in bed for a week? Got out of bed and you're so weak you can hardly stand up? Why? You've not exercised at all. You've not walked or, or done anything. And so it, you're drained. It's a really weird thing. You exercise and it drains you, but you're getting stronger. But if you don't exercise, you're drained and you're not getting stronger. That's the way love is. You practice loving people and you'll get better at it. You'll get stronger at it. It'll be hard. It's difficult. You have to call on the power of God. You stay on your knees. But the more you do it, the better you're able to do it. But if you don't do it, you just get weaker and weaker and more wrapped up in yourself. So we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And Jesus made this statement one time. He said, if you are coming to the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you or you have something against your brother, leave your gift there and go and get it right with your brother. So when you come, if you come, you're coming saying, Lord, I am willing to grow up spiritually and I am willing to do what just seems so hard, it's impossible, it's counterintuitive, it seems ridiculous. I am willing to believe the gospel and become a loving person, even to those who are so hard to love.